<clears throat> Father, we invite you here today to open our ears to hear, Father. Help us to have eyes that see, hearts of understanding. We thank you, Father, that when your son left, he sent the Holy Spirit to be our comforter, to be our teacher, to remind us of all the things that Jesus taught. I ask, Father, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Amen. <clears throat> All right, so everybody has your piece of paper, right? The white sheet of paper that we talked about a couple weeks ago. See everybody? Anybody needing one? We have extra. <laughs> I'll get it for you. Thank you. Oh, you don't need all of them, I guess. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Did you need one, Jesus? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> all right, if you have your Bibles, open up to First Chronicles. That's right before Second Chronicles. We have been working through what's my role and what's yours. Uh, last we talked, we saw how God called the nation of Israel to be priests unto him. And then later, uh, he, because of what he had done in, Israel, in Egypt, God declared that all of the firstborn of anything was his. Um, later on, when God established the priesthood, uh, the Aaronic priesthood, he chose the, the tribe of Levi to represent the firstborn of all of Israel. Okay? Uh, God said the firstborn is mine, but to keep things easy for you to understand, I'm going to take the tribe of Levi, and I'm going to make them the helpers of the priests. And... Uh, so Levi came to represent the firstborn. Now, within the tribe of Levi, uh, Aaron and his household were chosen to be the priests. The rest of the Levites uh, were assigned to assist. So in 1 Chronicles uh, 23, I'm just going to read a, a couple of things here. Uh, I would encourage you to um, read chapters 23 through the end of chapter 27. Um, it's, it's amazing to me. Um, well, we'll get to that in just a second. So I'm just going to read this little section. Um, when David was old and full of days, he made Solomon, his son, king over Israel. David assembled all the leaders of Israel and the priests and the Levites. The Levites, 30 years old and upward, were numbered, and the total was 38,000 men. 24,000 of these, David said, shall have charge of the work in the house of the Lord. 6,000 shall be officers and judges, 4,000 gatekeepers, and 4,000 shall offer praises to the Lord with the instruments that I have made for praise. And David organized them in divisions according to the sons of Levi, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. Okay, and then as we go down, we see that David is establishing uh, roles for these men to fill. Um, now, now, this is just a, a bit of statistics, but it's significant because every person in the tribe of Levi had a job. They had a purpose. They had a reason for being. Uh, we see that the, the, the bulk of them... Uh, some 24,000 will have charge of the work in the house of the Lord. They were responsible for assisting the priests. They were responsible for getting the water. They were responsible. For, they, they took care of all of the stuff so that the priests could do what the priests were supposed to do. Okay? So the bulk of them served, and if I remember right, it was in three shifts. At, at one point, it was two shifts. I think later it became three shifts. Um, then we see... 
uh, 6,000 shall be officers and judges. Uh, and we know that uh, they were also called to judge not just at the temple, or at this point, the tabernacle, but they were also called to judge in their communities. And 4,000 gatekeepers That sounds like a really boring job. I mean, my gate doesn't do much of anything. It just kind of sits there till I act on it. But 4,000 were gatekeepers. Uh, you read some of the stories as, as uh, time goes on in Kings, the, the gatekeepers actually had a significant part in the play of the uh, lineage of the kings. They were often called on to secure the temple and to secure the king. Um, so 4,000 gatekeepers and 4,000 shall offer praises to the Lord with the instruments that I have made for praise. Now, we kind of started in the middle of the story. A couple weeks ago, we talked about the choosing of Aaron and the choosing of the Levites. Um, and we have the books of the law establishing how things are to be done. Okay. Now what's amazing to me is that David took what was laid out in the Torah and he built on it. Okay. He, he took the foundation and David had the heart of a worshiper. Okay. I don't watch sheep. They don't interest me very much. Um, I, I would imagine that uh, if I were going to be a shepherd, I would need a stack of books or something. Um, because, you know, oh look, there's a sheep. Yay. I, you know, I know that, that actually they didn't just park it, uh, actually haven't been in Israel. Uh, they very rarely stayed still uh, because there's not that much for the sheep to eat. They have to move continually. Um, but David had time that he would worship God. And, you know, everybody remembers David as the warrior and, and he, he was a warrior king. As a matter of fact, because he was such a good warrior, he was not allowed to build the temple. Uh, now, one of the things that we need to remember in this passage is that David drew the designs and set aside the wealth for the temple to be built. He had it all drawn up. He had it all laid out. Uh, he, he gave out of his, his own uh, personal finances ridiculous amounts of gold and silver and bronze. Um, he then commissioned Solomon to put the plan into effect. Okay? But we don't often think of David as a worshiper once he becomes king. Okay? But you read a lot of the Psalms that David wrote, and, and, and some of them we can kind of tell by what they say, where he was, and, and some of them because it tells us that when David was hiding from Saul, you know, um, when David was before the Philistine king. Um, but we don't really think of David as a worshiper after he became king. But he had a plan. He knew how intrinsic music was to connect people to God. And conversely, as we see in a lot of today's music, to connect people to the world, to their own flesh and to the enemy. Okay. Um, without lyrics, music just is. Okay. It, it just is. It's like water. You know. This bottle of water would be worth everything a man owned if he were without water in the desert. This bottle of water would be of no value to a man drowning in the sea. Is it the water's fault in either case? No, water just is. Okay. Music just is. Now, 
We have music that we prefer, right? I mean, if they were not playing music that you guys found acceptable, either they wouldn't be here or you wouldn't be here. Um, you know, uh, I prefer softer, slower music. You know, I was the only kid in school that went home after school and listened to Bobby Benton and Eddie Arnold. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody else was listening to Black Sabbath and Def Leppard. Um, music just is. And I think David knew that he could take that neutral thing and use it to connect people to God. Uh, scripture says that, that the music went on 24 hours a day. Can you imagine that? Being able to go into the temple whenever and hearing praise and songs and hymns being lifted up to God. What an amazing thing. So we see going down through this, um, David is building on the foundation that Moses had laid, that God had laid in the Torah through Moses, and he's building on it and establishing how the temple would, would work, okay? And we see further on going down, he talks about the, the sons of Merari uh, and the other two sons, and he, he's given them, as you follow this through there, you're going to see that, that each of them is assigned a position. Now, I want to encourage you again, please, read through this. Because one of the things that we need to remember, that I need to remember, is there is not one word that's in here by accident. Okay? God keeps his word. His word tells us that the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of God will stand forever. And because in some way that I can't grasp, I believe that Jesus is in and about and throughout the written word. Okay? I don't think you can separate one from the other. So, I would encourage you to read through this. The one thing that I want to draw your attention to, though, is that David laid out, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, a specific schedule and a specific task for every person involved in the temple. Okay? From the priests all the way down to the gatekeepers and the shepherds. Now, by the way, um, as far as um, no, we'll, we'll, we'll say that for another time. Um, so, if you have your Bible, flip over to Hebrews. Going to, going to take a big jump here. Okay, so we've talked about um, that we are, as a matter of fact, I, oh, it must have been last week's. Um, First Peter calls us a what? A royal priesthood. We're a chosen generation. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. We looked at God's establishing Israel as a priesthood. We see that in the New Testament, this is, is brought forth in greater clarity um, because there's nothing in the Old Testament that doesn't have its connection, its accomplishing, or its furtherance in the New Testament. Some way, somehow. Okay? So God established Israel to be a priest, un priests unto the world. And then he redefined that. And then we see in the New Testament, uh, Peter takes that same idea and he says that we are now a priesthood. But, but we're not just a priesthood. We're a royal priesthood. <laughs> Now, this is something that is, is a little bit hard for people to understand because the, the kingdom was not given to and was never said to have been given to the Levites. Who was it given to? 
What tribe? Judah. Tribe of Judah. God established that. Actually, if you go back and you read uh, Jacob's blessing over Judah, it doesn't really make a lot of sense until you put it in perspective with everything that God did to bring about the birth of his son. Okay? So, we are all priests, but we're priests of, of royalty, and we'll see this in Hebrews. We are priests of royalty because we are kin, we are co-heirs with Jesus, who is a high priest. He is our high priest. But he's not of the order of Aaron. He's the order of Melchizedek. Okay? So we're going to touch on this for just a second because uh, I started a couple weeks ago showing you how God established these things in Israel and we're seeing their fulfillment or their furtherance in the New Testament. Uh, so, <clears throat> excuse me. Hebrews 5, 1 through 10 for every high priest chosen from among men, I'm sorry, I didn't tell you five yet, did I? I'll let you turn that. <clears throat> Chapter 5, verse 1. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. <clears throat> because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. Okay, so right here we see this encapsulation of what the priest's responsibility was. Uh, he was to offer sacrifices and gifts, but because he was, uh, how did he say it, beset with weakness, he had to start with his own sin first. Okay. Oh, hey, what's today? Is this Rosh Hashanah? Or is that no. next? Yesterday? No, it's not yet. Coming up. It's coming up. end of the month. End of the month. Hey, I got all kinds of time. My watch stopped. Um, all right. Back to this. The, the priest had to offer sacrifice. The high priest on the one day a year that he did um, go into the most holy place, he had to go and sacrifice for himself and his family first and then go back and offer for the sacrifices of the nation of Israel. Now, if we see this um, down here in verse 4, it says, And no one takes this honor for himself but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. Um, you read through uh, the, the lineage of the uh, nation of Israel and their kings and the split and the kings that took over the northern tribes, Ephraim. Um, we see that Jeroboam, uh, who was called by God to rule over the ten northern tribes, uh, he, he trusted God in becoming king, but he didn't trust God in the worship that God would hold true to his word. He believed that when the, the ten northern tribes needed to go and offer sacrifice for sin, uh, they needed to present themselves in Jerusalem three times a year. They, that when, when all of this was done, he was afraid that they would think, oh, okay, well, our temple is here. Let's just go back to the way things were. So what did he do? He created two golden calves and he set them up in two different places so that the people wouldn't have to go anywhere to offer sacrifice. Uh, as a matter of fact, because of this sin, uh, God spoke against the entire household of Jeroboam. Okay? He's one of three kings that I know in the northern kingdoms that the, the entirety of their house was cursed because of the, the sin of their father. Uh, one of the things that it says is that he made priests of those who could, uh, essentially, they, they could afford it or they, they earned the right. And, and he established them uh, with the idols and led Israel into sin. 
Okay, so we see that his sin wasn't just creating the idols, but he also called the priests. Who's, who's the only one tasked with calling the priests? Well, that's, that's God. That, that is his alone. Okay. Um, so, uh, no one does this for himself, but is called by God just as Aaron was. Uh, verse 5, so also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed to him by him who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And he also says in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplication with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Okay, just a, a couple other verses that I want to touch on real quick. Um, this, this whole uh, series of chapters 5, five 6, 7, uh, 8, they're, they're bringing back this connection to uh, the... Jesus being high priest, but not of the order of Aaron, not of the tribe of Levi, but of the order of Melchizedek and of the tribe of Judah. Uh, so we look over here in uh, chapter 6, verse 10. Uh, For God is not unjust, so as to overlook your work uh, and the love that you have shown for his... Wait, that's not right. Sorry, 620. Um, where Jesus is gone, we'll back up to 19. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, um, my dad and, and uh, well, actually pretty much just about every male in my family uh, served in the military. Um, my generation and the generation previous uh, was Navy, uh, and then my nephew, uh, one of them joined the Marines, which you can kind of go, okay, well, you know, they kind of, they're under the authority of the Navy, they're their own thing, but it's the ones that the Navy didn't want to be called sailors. Okay. So they put them in these suits and gave them a gun and told them to get off the ship and go attack the land. Okay. So one of them joined the Marines, the other joined the Army, and we're still trying to get over the shame. Um, no, really? Uh, I have nothing but admiration and respect for those who put their lives on the line to serve this country. Uh, I, I don't care what branch it is, even even the Air Force, uh, they're, they're putting it out there for us. Um, so, um, we have this hope as an anchor of the soul. A hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain. Now, now remember at this time, uh, and actually even up to today, Judaism, there's only one time a year that one person may go into the most holy place. Uh, and our hope is this anchor, this hope is that Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf into the most holy place. And I think that that is illustrated by the rending of the, uh, the veil. Uh, I, I think God is, is speaking through the sacrifice of his son and opening the veil to say, now I am approachable. The price for sin has been paid. You now have access to me, not because you're a high priest, not because you're a priest, not because you're a Levite, not because you're a Jew, but because Jesus paid the price in full. Okay? Jesus paid the price. Okay. So, uh, one, one more uh, verse here. Uh, chapter 7, actually, I'm not even going to try because it's the entirety of the chapter. Um, uh, we see in verse 1 that he starts talking about Melchizedek. 
Uh, he shows how great he was that even the forefather, the, the founding father of the nation of Israel would, would uh, render unto him a tithe. Um, we see that he has no beginning and he has no end. Um, this is why we, we look at Jesus as being a high priest of the order, order of Melchizedek because he has no beginning and he has no end. Um, fascinating study. Take a day, grab your colored pencils. The way I do it is I, I actually print off the chapters on like this side of the page and then I have the other side of the page for writing. And I, I, I make notes and I, I know some of you guys do triangles and circles and squares. I don't do that. I, I typically just use different colored pencils. Um, but, but dig into this. The, the core of what the writer of Hebrews is trying to get at is in these chapters. Okay? Um, and, what, and what is he trying to get at? What is the whole point of Hebrews? Anybody want to take a shot? There's, there's not a right or wrong answer. There's a more right and a less right answer. So you're going to get right unless we have to, you know, like kick you out of the church. <laughs> Anyone? Written for the Jews. I'm sorry? Written to the Jews. It's written to the Jews. Yep, but to say what? We have a great high priest. We do. That through, and, and I love, I don't know who the author was, I believe that it was someone very close to Paul, just because the, the number of phrases that echo what Paul writes in other epistles. I don't think it was Paul, because um, the writer of Hebrews doesn't know where these passages are. Have you ever read that? And he goes, it says somewhere. I love that. You know, because that gives me hope. But I know it's in there somewhere. I know it's on the left-hand side of the page, three verses above the blue mark. But don't ask me where it is. I don't know. I got to dig. I got to look for the blue mark. He is establishing, speaking to the, to the, the Hebrews, he is establishing the right and place of Jesus being the fulfillment of the Messiah, having accomplished what was needful, what was required by the law to redeem from the curse of sin, the curse of the law, first the nation of Israel, and then <coughs> the rest of the world. Okay. And that's kind of the theme that you see woven throughout here. He, he establishes in the early chapters Jesus being better than the angels, having a higher place than the angels. We see that his, his priesthood is higher than the, the Aaronic priesthood. Um, so being woven through this entire passage is, is the understanding that Jesus is something beyond what we can rationalize with our puny brains, but it's something that we need the Spirit of God to reveal to us. And there's not a person today saved or ever has been saved that hasn't been saved through the direct uh, manipulation, the, the divine intervention of the Spirit of God. Okay? Just as no one can be saved apart from the blood of Christ, no one would ever be saved except for the drawing of the Spirit. Okay? Um, and to me, that's fascinating and amazing and comforting that God the Father established a plan whereby His Son, God the Son, would sacrifice Himself for our sins and then send God the Holy Spirit to be our comforter, to be our guide, to be our teacher, to leave us never alone. Never alone. Okay, so I uh, encourage you to look at that. Um, now, what does this have to do with what's my role, what's your role? There's a couple things. Um, first, even though we are all priests, we see uh, in Chronicles, we actually see in, in uh, several books in uh, the Old Testament, that the priests were called priests, but they were given different jobs. Okay? So we as priests are all called to what was a, a priest's job? To intercede on behalf of the people before God, unto God. Um, we do that how? How do we represent the priesthood today? 
Well, I, I can give you one place to start, uh, the Great Commission. Um, if we are to be the intermediary between the people to God, and yet the price has already been paid such that um, we can add nothing to it or take anything away from it, what does that lead for us to do? It leaves for us to let people know that the grace of God has been given to them, that the cost for their sin has been paid, that there is a gospel, there is good news in this life, okay? We're, we're flipping the picture upside down. Whereas before they took the people's sins, they took their sacrifices, and they presented them to God, we've already been presented to God. Jesus is our intercessor. He's up there making intercession. He's defending us every day. Okay? So we're already okay there. But before Jesus left, he told us to be his witnesses. So we are taking what we've already seen accomplished at the cross, and we're bringing it out into the world. Okay? Every one of us is called to do this. Okay? There are those that have the gift of evangelism. That's actually in a couple weeks. We're going to be going through the gifts and, and talking about them a little bit. Um, but we see that those that are gifted with evangelism, they, they don't have to work at it. It just falls out of them. They, they can't stop. I have to think. There's so many times that... So, cashier will say something at the register and I'm just kind of calculating the costs in my head and how much food my son eats and I get my bag and I start to walk out and I think oh, there was an opening right there um, I'm getting better I'm getting better but we all have a testimony right hey, hey, okay look here Close your eyes for a second because I don't want any pressure on anybody. Close your eyes for a second. If you are a believer, put your hand up in the air. Okay, put your hands down, open your eyes. I can say this now because everybody put their hands up. Um, if you are a believer, you have to have a testimony. Okay? And all too often, we make our testimony a, a singular event, a, a fixed point in time. There may be something that came up to it, but this is my testimony. This is my witness. Nobody can take this from me. Okay? But that's just a part of our testimony. Okay? Because God doesn't stop there. He immediately begins working in us the process of sanctification whereby we would reflect Christ, the holiness of Christ, the righteousness of Christ to the people around us that we would begin to resemble him more and ourselves less. All right? So when we come to that, that place of faith, that's kind of the start of our testimony. And then as God brings us through things, as God teaches us things, as God matures us, as God works out all the ick that is in us, that's part of our testimony too. I can't do this by myself. Absolutely not. What is the point of the testimony? To draw attention to yourself? You know, that's one of the things that I get a little bit frustrated with. There's so many books out there, so many uh, very good books, um, but we tend to fixate on the dramatic. We, we tend to fixate on, um, you know, the person that that came out of a, a life of uh, drugs or sexual promiscuity or um, we like the cool stories. Every story is cool. Because in every story, in every testimony, you and I were stuck in our sins. My sins didn't look like yours. Yours didn't look like mine. But we were stuck. We had no way to get out from underneath the burden of our sin until the Spirit drew us to the cross. And then our testimony reflects every other testimony out there because he takes our rags and gives us clean linen. He washes us, he purifies us, and he sets upon our head a crown 
and he calls us his own. Okay? Now, as we grow, we should be adding to the story. Because the story didn't stop. Not until he takes us home. That story is continuing to grow. And I, I, I'll tell you, uh, don't panic if you feel like your testimony is not growing right now. Okay? Um, this might be a quiet season for you. Now, that's not to say if you're struggling with sin, that's an entirely different thing. You know, that's why our church needs to be a church of confession. Okay? We need to be open with each other about our sins so that we can get help, we can get prayer, we can get people to stand by us, we can get people that will help us to conquer that sin. Uh, but pride sneaks in, doesn't it? I don't want people to know that I do that. I don't want people to know that I think that. Um, God already knows. And the number one way that God has uh, designed in the scriptures to help you is through his body, the body of Christ. Okay? Um, Okay, a couple things that I want you to know today. I'm going to stick this in next week as we actually start getting into the different roles in the church. First, um, God established an order in the priesthood. First with Moses and then later uh, with David. God established the roles for each of the people. Uh, there was only ever one high priest at a given time. Um, and yeah, okay, Annas and, and Caiaphas, yeah, we, we know that's, uh, Annas was kind of ex officio. Uh, God established the high priest, the priesthood, the Levites. Uh, we see in the New Testament that Jesus is our high priest, uh, that we are called to be priests underneath him. Um, but, but what we're missing in this is what is our particular role. Now, we got to see this morning some of those, you know, what was it, uh, was it 2,000 that, that were given to the music in the temple? And we got to see some of those up here today that were gifted and called and blessed through music. Okay, and they could share with us. Again, music in and of itself just is. But when we put words to it that lift up and edify, uh, glorify God and edify one another, then it becomes powerful. Okay. Um, so we see uh, there are roles uh, in, in the New Testament. We're all called as priests, but we have different roles. We're going to get into that next week. We're going to take a look about how God established the, the body of Christ in the New Testament. Uh, and then after that, we're going to start moving into uh, the gifts and how they are used uh, in the body of Christ. Um, and I would encourage you, if you've uh, never taken one of the... Uh, uh, spiritual gifts tests I would encourage you to uh, I know there are several online I know several of you do not go online um, I gotta figure out a way to, to make that work maybe we need to get you a smartphone she laughs because that will never happen huh <laughs> okay if you have not um, Next week, I will have a, a, an address for you to go and take a test. Keep in mind, um, these are generally at best, okay? Um, they're only as good as the people that wrote the test, okay? So they're not surefire 100% on all the time. But it should give you a good idea of the giftings that God has given you. And when you understand those giftings, you can then understand your role. Okay? Father, we thank you for your word. Father, I thank you because you have not left us alone. Father, your word says that where two or more of us are gathered in his name, Jesus is right here with us. You have promised us that he would never leave us or forsake us. I thank you, Father, that your spirit is here. I ask, Father, that each day you would teach us to cling to you more and more. 
that those things that distract us, those things that are, are not of you, would pall. They would lose their luster. They would lose their attraction to us. And that we would more and more, more and more desire you. Give us understanding, Father. Teach us wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen.